Hey, for me down below the sea. Um, here it is. This is chapter two. This is uh, something that you've always wanted to know on a Monday morning. <laughs> We're going to read chapter two, and it's called The Fluke. F L U K E. And um, hopefully, um, somebody's going to come up to us here while we're reading the chapter. He might come out to see us, um, but at that point, we'll uh, see um, what we're doing here. Um, let's go with Lower the Trap, Chapter 2. I'll be reading, and you guys can uh, watch it. At the end of this, we're going to have a true and false uh, section where we're going to do a little comprehension on uh, true and false. Uh, what uh, is false with the question, and then what is true with the question. So here we go. This is Fluke. Uh, Graham read the unrealistically short list written in no Norris's scrawl. He recognized all the names, even though some were spelled wrong. The kitten tried to bat, bat the list anyways. Why isn't Lynette on the list, Graham asked. Lynette doesn't, doesn't like me, Norris replied. Not even a little, said Graham. What's her problem, asked Norris. He began to jingle the coins in his pocket. He kept pulling her hat down. You keep pulling her hat down over her eyes whenever you walk by. You do that? I'm her brother. Ah, and then. Uh, so you're going uh, to help me or what? Jingle, jingle. No, said Graham, handing the list back to Norris with the certainty of, of the returning tide. Spending time with Norris would be like pulling an empty lobster trap up during the height of the lobster season, a disappointing effort and unrewarding besides. Fine, said Norris, with tight lips across his braces. It's no skin off my nose. He snatched the kitten from Graham and then stuffed her back into the box. At the same time, there were hollers and cheers down at the government wharf. Both boys stopped to look for the porch, to look from the porch railing. An unusual large crowd had gathered by Hormaras too. Had gathered by the Hormaras too. I wondered what rattle what I'm wondering what's rattling their socks asked Norris in a very weird tone voice I w better get going said Graham yeah well I've got things to do said Norris not to be outdone but by the time Norris picked up his box Graham had taken full advantage of the distraction and given Norris the slip on, upon arriving at the government dock, Graham listened to the snippets of conversations as he wove between Goli Gal Goliath-sized fishermen in their black rubber overalls. Neither seen like this, neither seen, never seen like this, ugh, sorry, rewind, never seen the likes of it must be at least 50 years old. McDermott caught a corker like that in, in the day. Graham worked his way to the end of the dock. Other brightly painted lobster boats were still motoring in, screeching seagulls in close pursuit. But the Hormo Ho, Ho Maris too was already tied snugly to the wharf, cleats with ropes wound in a tidy figure eights. Hey, Dad, Graham called. His dad alone in the stern looked up at Graham. His crewman, Dexter, was not on board. The air hummed with fish bait. Where's Dexter, Graham asked, but as soon as his words got out of his mouth, he gasped. Hunkered down on the floorboards of his dad's feet was an enormous gargantuan lobster. It was particularly the size of fetch and its antennae, which looked like bicycle spokes, were swinging zigzags in the sea breeze. You caught that? Graham asked above the rising din. 
You bet, said his dad, a proud grin on his face. Dexter had to go to the dentist today, but I took a run to check the lines anyways. This one got its claw caught trying to grab an easy dinner from one of the traps. Come aboard and have a closer look. Graham scrambled down to the wharf ladder and hopped onto the boat. He made his way to the stern. Geez, Louise, he says, explained Graham, getting down on one knee to have a closer inspection. But be, be careful not to get too close. Look at the size of those claws. Out of the water, the gigantic lobster could barely move under its massive weight, but its armored claws, too big for elastic bands, were bound by electrical tape just to be safe. The behemoth stared at Graham with its black, beady eyes, an incredible specimen indeed. I'd make a great trophy for your shed, said Graham. It would make a great trophy for your shed said Graham, in addition to occasionally capturing creatures other than lobsters in his traps, tentacles, sea cucumbers, and once a very small flounder, which gave to Graham for his sub-saltwater tub in his room, right? Because that's a sub-saltwater tub in his room. Graham's dad also filled a shed in the backyard with curious treasures he had dragged up over the years. Round bottom bottles and fragments of china, anchors from pirate ships and pewter glass and gallery spoons with chew marks and old lead sounding and cannonballs from battles long ago. There was even a fine tooth comb made out of bone, which Graham's dad told him old time sailors used to comb out their lice. A mounted gi giant lobster would be nice to his collection. Fancy catching this in our very own bay, he da his dad mused. I've... It's got to be a fluke, said Graham, quickly dismissing the idea that there could be anything left of interest in the water so close to his home. He stood to look beyond the harbor, harbor's raggedy entrance to the open, choppy sea. Someday he'd be diving out there, exploring the ocean's uncharted floors, where he'd be certain to find a mysterious gigantic lobster had, had wandered in from. Graham's dad silently followed his gaze. Say, swimmer, what's that you got? A nasal voice come down, called down from the wharf. Graham and his dad looked up. It was pasty Edward Fowler. Norris's dad and the cannery's owner. He was wearing a double-breasted suit bought by the dads and lads, the fanciest men's store in town. His anchored pattern silk tie had been flipped over his shoulder by the sea breeze. He had n a narrow set of eyes, just like Norris. That's a lobster, Ed, joked one of the fishermen on the board, on the wharf. I guess you're the, used to seeing the canned ones on the Sunday picnics. Graham understood that jab. Unlike the owner of the cannery, fishermen could never afford to take time off during the lobster season. The other men laughed at the rigging, but Edward Fowler persisted. That make a fine trophy for the cannery, he observed, his eyes firmly fixed on the monster lobster. The cannery! Another fisherman scolded. Are you kidding? Once reporters get wind of this story, I bet there'll be hundreds of offers from all over the world for this lobster. The crowd rumbled in agreement. Edward Fowler shoved his fists in his pockets and jingled the coins inside. That lobster should stay in lower narrow spit, he argued. I still on the prize, and I'm prepared to pay to keep it here. Graham's dad turned to the cannery owner, the front of their overall shimmering with loose fish scales from cutting up the day's bait. Tell you what, he announced to the throngs of gawkers as he laid his calloused hands on Graham's shoulders, I think I'll put today's catch up for auction at the lobster festival. He turned to Graham, and if I get the highest bid, of the evening, I'll spend the prize money by taking my young marine biologist here on a little trip. 
maybe to Big Fish Aquarium. Big Fish Aquarium, Graham repeated in delight. Graham knew that each year, whoever donated the item that attracted the highest bid at the auction would win prize money totaling more than enough for a trip to Big Fish. Then, to add to his excitement, he realized that the town's annual lobster festival was just over a week away. Norris's dad turned on his heels and stormed back to the cannery. But Graham's dad still had to tally the daily catch. So Graham headed home on his own after hosing down the boat. He bounded up the front stairs two at a time. Once he got to the covered porch to give Fetch a pat, Graham stopped short. Would the giant lobster really attract the top bid so that his dad could claim the prize money? Last year, the builder of the homemade dory received the award after a stunning bidding war took place over his masterpiece. Graham stood at the railing and surveyed the town below, where the festival would soon take place. It was quiet now. The only person he could see was Ferguson, another classmate, walking at a mortician's pace along the main street that wove past Graham's house with a bat-shaped kite draped over his shoulder. Graham was almost to call out to Ferguson, but then he spotted someone else on Main Street. It was Norris working his way back up to Graham's front porch. Geez, Louise, uh, muttered Graham, feeling something sour inside. And that's chapter two, kids. Um, and then I'll just show you. I, you might have had a glimpse of him as he walked up our way to the camera. But here he is. Here's Billy the Blue Lobster. So hopefully you can see Billy the Blue Lobster there. And uh, I think he can. I think he can. I think he can. Um, he's right there with the uh, two little the fishy wishy wishies of you above you. So there's the sea creature, the Billy the Blue Lobster. So uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed chapter two. And then uh, we'll uh, talk to you later on. So we will see you later. See you, Billy.